I think the key to making fast shots is getting a good workflow that works for you. And so what I do here uh, may or may not be ideal uh, for your situation. I personally get by here, I'm like 92 degrees boiling. So this works for me. I know some people want to get everything as hot as they can. And if you can, even better. Um, so if you're going to use like a mocha pot or something to preheat like a lot of you do, then that's great. But I'm always trying to not make too much fuss over it, get a good result. And I feel like when you start getting extra things out like a mop pot and, uh, or like boiling water and tongs and uh, grabbies and whatever, like it just starts to add to the complexity and it starts to feel like a lot. Uh, you know, if somebody watches a video like that and they're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's just like a ton of work or that's convoluted, that's, you know, busy. So I'm always trying to keep it simple, uh, partly because I wanna make sure that, you know, I have a way to show you to keep it simple. So that's kind of what the goal is tonight. So I've got my brew head in here. This is that funnel system that I think Pedro was probably the first one uh, to show us about that. But I would say go ahead and preheat both together or you could just preheat the cylinder by itself. It's up to you. Again, if you're doing a dark roast, you probably don't need to get this as hot um, as say some of us that are doing a medium or a light roast. But it's never a bad idea to just get everything hot. So I'll go ahead and leave that steaming while I'm over here prepping the basket. Um, just want to point out that if you are constantly getting up and making coffee for yourself and for somebody else, then it really does uh, help to have little hacks. Like for instance, some of you guys are already doing this. You can pre-dose out your coffee before you even um, you know go to bed. Somebody just asked today, like you know, do you suggest or would it be okay if I grind the night before? And I would, I think most of us would say no. It's a bad idea. Um, the moment you grind that coffee. You release the CO2, the aromas, the flavors, and so it's just not going to be as good. But you can do other things like, you know, pre-dose it so that it's one last thing I have to worry about in the morning. I don't have to weigh anything out. Um, or just in general, if I'm going to try to bang out a shot for myself and somebody else, I don't want too much time to pass between the two things because then they might be enjoying their coffee and I'm over here still making mine. Um, so it's probably, you know, whatever you can do. Somebody else also asked about paper filters uh, today and said, like, is, is it worth doing? Uh, something that you might not consider, but for this today, I'm going to show you one idea is uh, if you ever used a regular, quote unquote, regular espresso machine, like a pump machine, they typically, when you cut the pump, there's a three-way solenoid valve and the water goes, gets evacuated out. That's kind of why they have dry pucks and we don't, because whatever water is still sitting there on the puck gets pulled out and drained out. Um, but what that also does is it pulls any kind of coffee material up and through the screen. So if you had a regular machine, you know you've got to pull your dispersion screen off all the time and you got to clean behind that. You know, you should be doing that hopefully once every other day or so. Um, but guys like uh, Gabor Lasko, uh, he's actually using filter screens, uh, I'm sorry, filter paper all the time, probably for decades, because he knows that if you use this, uh, you basically stop the coffee material from going up in, into your screen. So likewise, if I'm going to do back to back and this is going to be a little bit muddy and wet and dirty, I could actually just place that screen between the coffee and, uh, and the dispersion screen. And then that way, when I go to clean this, this should be pretty clean and ready to go. And I won't have to like wipe it, dry it, uh, clean it, that kind of thing. So I'm going to show you that today. That's one of the other little hacks. So like having your, your coffee pre-dosed, maybe possibly using that, maybe you don't want to having a quick way to preheat. And then also as I'm making my coffee, um, as I, I'm sorry, as I'm getting the next basket prepped, I'm going to put that cylinder back on there and let that steam so that that's staying hot and I'll be able to just quickly move in. I'm also going to try to do a latte for one. I'm going to pull. So normally I'm drinking espresso. My wife's drinking a latte, so I'll be making mine straight and neat and then she'll have the latte. So that's kind of what I was going to show you today. So I've got to manage this while I'm trying to do this and talk to you. Uh, so I'm trying to keep that going as well. Uh, so if you guys have questions, Antoine's going to help me at the end of my demonstration by uh, kind of collecting any kind of questions you put in the comments so that I can just look in one place. So hopefully uh, if you guys have questions, put them there and he'll, he'll round them up for me. All right. Uh, let's see. Could you still dosing containers are you using? Uh, these, yes, these are um, makeup. I think uh, like makeup jars or whatever. I'll try to find you that link later, but they're just... Um, yeah, just kind of like little makeup jars uh, for powder or something like that, and it, and it works well. Okay, so the other thing to keep in mind, though, um, when it comes to the time it takes to brew, I don't really count preheating, especially this way, uh, or that as like into the time. And I'm also going to say like 
the time that it takes me to grind today with a manual grinder should be pulled out because if you've got something like a sete, you're probably grinding in seven seconds. So like, meanwhile, you know, I'm still here 30, 45 seconds later grinding one shot, you've already been able to get through all of that. So I think that some of us have grinders. If it's a hand grinder, you could have a grinder like a Hario or something. You're gonna be there for five minutes, six minutes, and that's like per shot. So, you know, that's 10 minutes right there. You've just sunk into grinding coffee, which is kind of a bummer. So I don't think that, for the purposes of how long does it take to make espresso that we should talk about that because everybody's going to have a different grinder. Even my, uh, my Niche Zero, I bought it with the, um, the NFC disc. It's this little disc that kind of slows the way the coffee gets in. If you didn't have that, the coffee gets in faster, you grind faster. Mm, I don't know if it's kind of negligible, maybe like, uh, uh, maybe it would have been like 10 seconds to grind without the disc and it's maybe 20 seconds, 25 width. But just all these things to keep in mind, depending on your grinders. Um, that's also going to cut into time. But also like with preheating, if you've ever had a normal espresso machine, a pump machine, a lot of them, if it doesn't have a thermal block, if it has like a boiler, you've got to turn that thing on 30 minutes before you even want coffee, if you want it to be good. You've got to let the whole thing heat up the boiler and then water needs to circulate through the group head. So, you know, it's actually faster with a manual machine because these take like three minutes to get going. And if you're steaming, then it's also preheated at the same time. So you could actually bang out a coffee in like under 10 minutes from the moment you wake up to, uh, to when you come and turn things on. But I would just say like, turn these things on, get them going, that way everything's nice and hot. Um, all right, I'm gonna get into it. So again, I already pre-dosed. I don't know if you guys wanna start a timer or not. I'm just gonna go ahead and go into it. When I time myself, it's usually about five minutes to uh, bang out two shots and I think that's without a latte. And that still accounts for, whoop, counts for the grinding here, which I forgot to put my little uh, screen on. So when it comes to grinding, again, it's gonna be relative to what you're using, what you're doing. I wouldn't pre-ground, I would save that until right before you're gonna pull your shot. And, uh, but have it all ready to go so that when you pull the one shot, you'll be able to quickly prep the basket and you won't have to sit here and grind again. So I'm just gonna grind uh, two shots at one time. There's one shot right there. And then I'm going to load it again with the next shot. Get those out of my way. I have a really small little area to work with, sorry. I might knock a few things over. All right, and then I'm gonna take this off. Make sure that you dry that, of course. Any kind of moisture in there is gonna be a problem for when you go and uh, add that coffee. So depending on what you're doing, uh, ah, it's a little tight in here. Depending on what you're doing, um, if you have all the tools and you like to use those, that's obviously gonna take more time if you're sitting there and leveling it out and then you're gonna um, use all the fancy tools. I like to use those sometimes too, but for the purposes of tonight, just kind of trying to see how quickly we can make coffee when you've got people waiting, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get fancy. I don't actually get fancy too often. I like those tools uh, from LA Creative Works and Ipoctola, but uh, I don't generally use them day in, day out. All right, so I have that at least ready to go. So one less thing to think about and deal with. And uh, yeah, depending on what you're gonna do here, a little bit of shake, shake, level that out. And then I like to use my little tool just a little bit. Give it a couple taps. Get that on there. And like I said, I'm gonna use that paper filter. Slide that down. Pull that off. The nice thing about this kettle, and I don't know what, what you have at home, but this kettle, you have a keep warm function and you don't have to keep pressing to keep warm. So like, I just put it back down it's still keeping warm, so I don't have to think about that, which is clutch. And get my scale going. And this counter is pretty high up, which is kind of a bummer. But uh, I think I've told you before, like I just like to lean in with my body weight to go ahead and make sure that I'm not working too hard. Especially because today, like I said, I don't know how many shots I've pulled already. If I were uh, using my arms too much, and I would be pretty tired here pretty quick. So I'm just kind of in the eight, nine bar range. This is actually going a little bit slow. 
but I should probably pull this. So this is gonna be the latte, the first shot, so I'll pull this a little short. This will be like a one to two for me. Maybe a little bit less. Just to make sure that I like my espresso to cut through the milk. So I'm coming up on 44 seconds and about 32 grams, and I'm gonna call that good. And so the quick cleanup, without losing too much heat here, I'm just going to dump that water out. And I'll separate it over here just in case there is some more water. Use my plunger, or I'm sorry, my uh, dose cup. Put that back on over there while I'm dealing with it. And so shout out to uh, Dave Stewart. This is something I've done in the past, but honestly, because I have a knock box, I don't really bother with it. But he was like pointing out that you could be using your preheat cap. Uh-oh, this is getting too hot. I'm gonna blow over here. Uh, use your preheat cap to knock that out if you wanted to. So the nice thing is you, I just turned it over after I squeezed it out and that screen came out nice and clean. Just pointing out there's no coffee on that, which is sweet. And so then I can dump this out. Well, I'll do it here for you. There we go, and got that out and out of the way. So this is pretty clean and not too bad off. So I'm just gonna quickly dab it. Make sure I get the moisture off. Come over here and prep the next basket. And again, I'm just trying to work fast enough so I don't have anything cooling off on me. And of course, that's still heating over there, so that's good. And I'm not going to bother with the filter that time around because I'm not really worried for the second cleanup. All right, so I'm going to pour this into my latte glass up and get that going again. So everything stayed nice and hot. The portafilter was nice and uh, hot still there, working fast enough. And this, of course, was back there preheating. So the idea is work fast, keep things heating while you're doing others, and you should be good. I really wish this counter was a little bit lower. <laughs> Any questions? Could you share the bar mat you're using? Yeah, I can do that too. Most of the stuff is Amazon. I know that some people aren't stoked on Amazon, but it's really easy for us to, uh, to get the things you need. Easy, you know, and where I live, I'm too far away from going anywhere to go pick these things up. I'm a... Uh, mostly buying everything on Amazon. So I am coming in to about 32. I'm gonna run this one a little bit longer because this is the one I'm gonna drink straight. And so that's 45 seconds, about 38 grams. All right, so that's done. Turn that off and let's get over here and make a latte. Turn this away from my computer. Leave that. Hopefully I'll have more success with this one than I did there with the uh, nanoformer last time. But again, I've never claimed to be a latte artist. There's so many people in the group here that are uh, much, much better than me. I'm just trying to show you how to do this, if you're going to do it. All right. shaking for some reason. No surprise. Alright, not too bad. I didn't choke this time. I don't know if uh, Danny's there. I don't know if you can even really see it that well, but uh, I did not choke this time on my latte, which is good. And uh, I might drink the latte, but I'm not going to drink the, the espresso, to be honest. I'll put that in the freezer for tomorrow or the fridge tomorrow. So again, I guess I'll just clean this up for you just so we can complete the series. Dumping that out. Twisting that off. I'll do it over there again. 
And uh, yeah, I like this idea of, I saw Dave actually using his fingers for most people that don't wanna touch that stuff hot. So this usually works out or something smaller than that. That way you can squeeze out the water and you won't have that going on. But again, I do recommend you get a, recommend you get a um, knock box if you don't already have one, it's just a lot easier. But this works a treat. Thanks Dave for bringing it back up. Um, that's awesome. And as far as the cleanup, I get that question a bit as well. Honestly, I would just rinse this underwater if I had my faucet nearby um, and just hang it out to dry on that bar mat. I don't use products for this. Um, every once in a while, maybe once a month, I'll pull out my, my O-rings. There's two O-rings in your plunger if you don't know that, uh, and then one here, and I'll pull those out and just kind of wipe behind it. But again, I don't use any products. I just use paper towels and water. I don't want anything stuck behind there. You don't need to. Um, all those cleaning products you see online, it's because most people don't have access to the internals of their machine and they have to like push it through and clean it out in different ways. But when you can access everything, you just need water, a little bit of elbow grease, um, and you're good. And I'm going to enjoy. I'm really proud of that, guys. This is actually, I'm going to take a photo and send it to you in case you guys don't see it. I don't usually do so well when I'm on camera, but this one looks nice. There we go. Is it meta if I upload that to our group right now? Let's try that. Comment. Photo. Oh, I can't do that, can I? Won't let me add a photo. Well, that's lame. I'll show you later. All right, that's kind of it. I wanted to show you blowhard. Are you calling me a blowhard? Oh no, blow that puck out. No, I'm not gonna blow that puck out. That's hot, that metal's hot. You don't wanna like put your mouth on that. The, um, I don't have it here, but the signatures, of course, and the classics, you can blow it out from there, but I wouldn't bother. All right, Antoine, did you get, did anybody have any questions? Are you guys just all saying, hey, hey, what's up, great. If you guys have any questions, I wanted to do this with Zoom because Zoom, you all have audio, you can pipe in and then the, I think it's just better for that. But uh, I honestly haven't figured out, and by the way, if there's anybody, like I think Chris Greenfield, you're probably a pro at this. I need to get StreamYard set up so that I can use the, uh, the streaming keys. I don't know how to do that. I wasn't able to figure that out. Um, yeah, push it, push it real good. Uh, this is, uh, I forgot that guy that, uh, I forgot his name, but anyways, you know the tool that uh, from Clockwork. So has anybody got any questions for me while you got me? Thank you, yeah, so I guess you could see that. I don't see any questions. You're doing great, don't blow out the pucks. No, um, you're an animal, yeah, Matt. I mean, you could, it's fun, but I mean, if you're, again, you're making this for somebody else, if it's your partner, I'm sure he or she will be okay with you putting your lips on that, but I think other people are gonna get disgusted. So if you're having a party, if you're Bob Lowe and you're having a coffee party, you can't put your mouth on that basket and blow at it. People were like, no, no, it's okay, especially COVID days. I don't think anybody wants that. Um, so that probably wouldn't work out. Yay, Craig, thanks for joining. This will be, you know, this will be in the, in the group afterwards so that you can, Definitely watch that. I'm amazed you can handle the portafilter and the cylinder. Yeah, so I used to uh, work in the restaurant business with brick ovens, so I do have quite a, uh, quite a lot more uh, comfort with heat. Um, so that's definitely something that, I don't know, I don't have any calluses. Although, you know, the fingerprint uh, on your phones and your, your tablets, they don't work for me, and that might be, might be it. I might, have, uh, I might have those calluses. Morning, Benjamin. Um, could you share where the bar mat, oh, so, I mean, seriously, it's just Amazon, Yash. It's like you just go to Amazon, type in bar mat, get the size you want. Actually, this is the thing I love that I don't see people asking me enough about. This is like a six by six inch rubber pad. It's just a great little pad for tamping and everything. Um, and this is, yeah, I, I forget who it is. It's like one of those espresso parts kind of names. Uh, but this is a really good tamper that uh, tamping pad that I like to use for all my prep. And then, yeah, get those bar mats, you can adorn your entire coffee um, coffee station the way that uh, Pedro does, or you could just get one, but it, it works great. You can dry stuff off right there. Tell me about that milk frothed, tell me about that milk frothed through. I'm not sure I understand the question, Corwin. Um, do you have silicone spacers you use for the, so when it comes to these silicones, I used to say like get one that fit your kettle and measure 
the diameter, but honestly, this one's kind of my favorite and I'm over the whole like cutting it up because actually it works better when you have a rim that keeps it from falling in. I cut the other ones up. I think they're over here somewhere. And then what happens is it fits nicely, but then as it heats up, sometimes it kind of falls in. So I just say, get this mega guy. He's large, he's huge. He's like four and a half across. Um, and he's got a nice shelf in there and then just collapse it so it fits yours. And that way, like you won't have a kettle that is too big for this one. Um, even the, uh, I've got a Chemex kettle over there that's massive opening and even this works for that. So you just like collapse it and use it that way. Little late night flare action. Nice. Uh, could we get a demo of the 58 another time? Could you share the dosing containers? Yeah, I already talked about that. Okay, good morning. Uh, Steam one, latte art ahead. Yes, Danny, oh, you made it. What time is it over there for you, man? Dang, and I killed it too. I, I won't use any language here, but I killed it. I'm very proud. Because if, if it went anything like the last time, I think everybody would lose all, all faith in me. Uh, 29 watching, thanks, 30 watching, cool. Well, it's not 100, but maybe those guys will show up later. All right, can you talk a little bit about using the full 24 gram dose? Uh, yeah. So I assume you're talking about the max on this. Honestly, it could be more than 24 for whatever coffee you're using. This is like a choose your own dose or your own adventure. You could go as low as you can go before. So if you have the pro, you'll, you'll find that taper at some point. And for everybody in their coffee, that means a different minimum. So like with the coffee that I use, I'm always safe at 16 grams. I can probably get down to 15. If you have a really dark roast, you can probably go all the way to 14. And then in the other direction, of course, you can put as much coffee as you want in there that will fit. Um, and if you like dry pucks, fill it up. Because if you fill this all the way up with coffee and in the tamped surfaces there at the top, you're going to be able to push all the water through and out and it will be a nice dry puck. But if you like a low dose like I do, you're always gonna have water sitting here because this plunger, uh, it's a little bit hot still, this plunger is only gonna go so far inside to push out. So you're always gonna have a little bit of water. So if you like dry pucks, fill this up to the top. That way you'll like express, push through all the water. I think that you wanna keep your doses as low as you can um, as a general rule of thumb. And the reason being is twofold. The taller that coffee puck is, is in your basket. So if you put 24 grams in there, you're gonna have this huge coffee puck. You have to grind coarser. The more coffee you add to that, the, the coarser you have to grind. Otherwise, you're never gonna push through the eight, nine bars that you would have with that same coffee um, and say at the same grind at say like 16, 16 or 18 uh, grams. So you have to grind coarser. And as we know, you wanna grind as fine as you can for the extraction without causing other issues, um, like not you know having too much metal showing, which means Water is not going through the whole bed. So grind as fine as you always can. That's, that's kind of a general rule of thumb. Um, so the less coffee you use, then therefore you can grind finer. Uh, also the temperature that the water is hitting up here is going to be different than when it gets through to the bottom of the puck. So you're not going to be extracting at that temperature. Um, that coffee is actually gonna suck out a lot of the heat, the energy through the extraction. So the less coffee you have in there, the less work this all has to do, you'll get a better extraction. So I'm not a fan of, of putting in more coffee. Um, if you really need 24 grams, uh, more power to you, but I would suggest not. Again, it's general rule of thumb, the thinner your cake is, the better your extractions can be. You'll be able to grind finer. You'll be able to have the same temperature extracting at the top as the bottom. Uh, any other questions? Let's see, which direction would you put the dispersion screen? All right, Kim. Uh, let me get that coffee out of the way so I can pull that screen out. So if you have the, yeah, if you have the Pro, even the signature, you'll see that the holes look different on one side, but the Pro is the only one that you actually have an option of flipping around. So uh, Bobby Lumia is no longer here. I don't, that guy's like MIA, but Bobby Lumia has more understanding of fluid dynamics than I do. And he claims that this is laminar flow and it doesn't really matter which side it is when you're putting pressure on even. Um, it's not gonna change the extraction. So I've always said flip a coin. But one thing that you know some people have shown, depending on which direction you started at, the way that the, uh, someone did that recently with a, a filter. Uh, they had it up here, added water to it. I need to turn this off, I did. Uh, added water to it and then they were looking at the flow pattern. I think that that's 
kind of a, I would say that's kind of artificial because it's not sitting on the coffee bed. If it's sitting on the coffee bed and you're putting pressure like eight, nine bars or whatever it is, I don't think that that same pattern is what we're gonna get. So I don't really think that matters either. Um, the only other thing I'll say about it is, it seems like if you have the small holes up and you add water, water is less likely to get through the screen until you add pressure. And so I guess the way I look at it is, I don't wanna pre-wet. I know that's kind of a popular thing these days. People are doing a pre-wet. They're just pouring water in and letting it sit there for 30 seconds or 45 seconds without any kind of pressure. That water's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there like the first few millimeters. Uh, Robert, I don't know if you were here, but Robert did his um, transparent portafilter uh, studies where you're showing like you add water to the top, you don't add any pressure. That water's through capillary action is only gonna get so far. So why would you want like an entire bottom section of dry coffee and this really soppy wet part up here that's already extracting and doing things? Uh, it changes the dynamics. So I like to keep things as dry as possible until I'm actually doing it and as evenly as possible. So whatever you do to one particle of coffee or one part of the puck, you wanna do it to the whole thing. Um, and you're not doing that if you're doing this 30 or 45 second pre-wet. You're only affecting those first few millimeters. So as far as which side up, I don't know, go with, like I said, flip a coin or go with your gut or, or look what other people are saying. I don't really have a preference. I don't really pay attention too much. If I do pay attention, small holes up. It's kind of what I'm doing. Hey Roland, you're welcome. Hopefully new kettle next week. Nice, Craig. Uh, which direction, da, 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 da. I think he means the milk steamer. This guy here, oh, there's Dave. My funnel came in today and it was too small, bummer. Yeah, get the, get the biggest funnels you can. It needs to be four and a half uh, to four inches if you wanna do something with your, uh, if you have this kettle. This is a, I think it's a three point something, 3.5 or whatever inches, so you have to have at least bigger than that. But again, you can't go wrong if you get this big but this big guy here. I linked it already uh, in the group and we can try to find it again for you. Uh, but the, this, is the, um, this is the red steamer. And then back there, I've got the Bellman. The red steamer is awesome, really hard to get. It's Antoine's favorite, uh, my favorite, ja, my buddy Justin's favorite. A lot of people like it. Uh, but it's hard to get. It's one guy doing it. And, he's, uh, and now I think he's supplying some of our distributors, so he's probably got his hands full. I don't know how many he's cranking out, but it takes a while and it comes from Indonesia. Um, if you could do a group buy, I think you usually get these for about 120, 140. Um, and then the, your best bet is that Bellman. Those things are everywhere. They've been making them for decades and you can find them on eBay. Um, and you can find the ones that are called like cappuccino makers or coffee makers, and you just don't use the coffee maker part, just use the steam wand. And you can even get those in electric. I have one over there that's electric. Um, not a stove top, so if that's what you want, you can find those old ones. It's like CX uh, 25, and then depending on, uh, I think that's CX 50 uh, SS, and then the the other ones with the coffee makers are CX 25s. Uh, so, and those you can buy new for about 100 bucks, or you can buy them used for 55, 45, 65. Any other questions? What milk steamer that I answered? Okay, how is the second shot affected if you have a second PF packed, tamped, and ready to swap in. Well, so William, the question I have for you is how hot is it going to be? The nice thing about me using one is it's nice and hot, ready to go. I already had it preheated. So if you already have it prepped, it's been prepped and sitting there cooling off. I don't know. Does it matter? It's up to you. I don't really mind using one, and I like just having less parts because, as you can see, I'll knock stuff around. But you have to get this hot as well, or at least the same temperature because if this is starting cold and the other one's hot, because I preheated it that way, they're gonna run a little bit different. So, um, I don't know. If you, if you were here when I pulled the shot, did it take me that long really? I don't think so. I think that it, you could do that. What's the best pulling stance to get a stable pressure? Best is to drop your table. So this table is too high for me. This is like 40 inches. Um, put it down on the table and just lean into it. If you use your body weight, you can control your body and you can lean in very measured, very slowly, very controlled. If you're using arms, it's different. You're kind of bouncing around. So I feel like the best position is to get right over it. One hand here, like this, arm bar it, and just lean into the shot. Um, another thing is it prevents it from moving around. You've seen people pull shots and the flare is moving away from them on the counter. It's because they're over here doing this and as they're pulling, they're pushing. And so this is constantly 
you're losing, uh, as, as you're pushing, obviously, right? Like you have to push harder because it's moving further away. So if you keep it right here underneath you, you can drive all that force right into the table. You can lean into it. Um, but again, putting it lower down on a lower table so you can just kind of lean in and not have to be up here is probably your best way. Could you share the dosing containers you are using? Uh, yeah, so I, I, thanks, Antoine. I think I went through that. Do you know if the silicone spacer you fits the Bonavita kettles? Yeah, so like I said, um, the Bonavita kettles, I think three inches is all you need for that. But again, the, the nice thing about this one, I don't know if you can see too well, but there's, a, there's like a, a rim there, a nice little ledge. And that really takes this heavy weight and, I mean, fits perfect. It's funny when you find something, it's just like, did they make this for flair? Because it feels like it did. So I like this one. It's got a nice ledge. You could trim this down if you wanted to. I would just say, get this big one so you're not like poor Dave, where you buy one and it's too small. Um, and then it's got that nice lip where most of them don't have that ledge. They just have these sort of accordion looking things. Uh, so that's, that's my suggestion there. Temp of the water chamber you preheated. Uh, so this is set at 92 because that's as much as I can boil here. If I could boil higher, I would. I would have probably set that at, I don't know, 94, 95. I prefer that I would catch on the way down because that way you can go hotter than you need it. And once you figure it out with like a thermometer or a thermopen, how quickly your temperature is dropping in the brew head, in the kettle, if you took it off heat, I don't know where, you know, what your situation is, but the moment you take that off heat, it's cooling, right? If you don't have that warming feature, uh, when you start adding the water to the brew head, it's cooling there too. So try to figure out how fast things are cooling in your system, in your house, in your ambient temperature, and then go above that, shoot above that for your temperature and catch it on the way down based on the knowledge you have of like, oh, I have 20 seconds to work here, 15 seconds, 30 seconds before I fall into my ranges. Um, but like here, I'm already at the bottom end, 92 degrees, 197 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. That is on the lower end for a medium roast. Um, so I'm not going as hot as I can, but then I don't have a choice. What's the temp of the water chamber? Don't, don't blow it, puck. Show the left shower screen side. I noticed the pros cylinders come with minimal effort, even when hot. Um, on my classic, the cylinder is very tight when hot. So the thing about that, and I don't have it with me, but I think you know the difference. Oh, there it is. Metal and plastic will expand at different rates, right? So, and at a different, co uh, what is the word for that? Like, a, not just different, different time and rate, but also uh, amount. So like a plastic will expand far greater than say metal. So it is going to be the case when this is piping hot, which is good, that means that you, you're doing a really good preheat, that plastic's going to expand and it's gonna really fill that little sleeve. So it is, you know, and some people notice it's a little bit loose here. And the reason why it has to be a little loose is because it is going to expand on you when it gets hot. And when it gets hot, then it's hard to pull out. So in your case, you know, if you are trying to do back-to-back -back shots, you are gonna have to run just this piece under cold water to cool it off faster um, than what this is cooling off. So, but that is just the nature of plastic and how it expands. So that's, that's why um, it's a little bit harder with, with yours to like pull it apart. And then as far as like, yeah, the, the taller pucks in your classic, so your 16 grams um, in a 40, mil, uh, 40 millimeter portafilter is going to be taller and narrower than ours in a pro, so it's gonna come out a little bit easier. That taller that is, the harder it is uh, to come out, so you should definitely be blowing on that. Uh, let's see, this is the same for all three brew heads I have, any pointers? Yeah, so we talked about that, the plastic. Can you talk a little bit about using full dose? Which direction? Would you put, thanks by the way, Antoine, for putting these together for me. It'd be a lot harder for me to get through all that. Uh, would you disperse the screen? How is the second shot affected if you have second PF packed? We already went through that. Oh, I'm just going back through. Is it common that the coffee ages, you have to readjust coffee grinder? Absolutely. All of a sudden my shots are pulling quicker and have not changed anything. Yeah, so there's a few things there. Um, hold on. Your coffee, so I had the opposite issue today. I woke up and I had just roasted coffee on Wednesday and it did not have enough time to rest. And I made two shots in a row, the one coffee and one of the other, and I couldn't drink any of them. I threw them in the, <laughs> threw them in the sink. And uh, I, was, 
I literally had just enough coffee to like do these demos for you of the good coffee that's rested. So you can use coffee that's too fresh. And when it's too fresh, that is too much CO2 that needs to get out before you can get in and, and pull out the material. Because think about it, if you, you know, um, CO2, I forgot what the temperature is, but as soon as water gets to a certain temperature, it doesn't want to hold any CO2. So whereas your soda is cold, will have a lot of CO2 inside, you can't keep CO2 inside um, hot water. And so the moment you hit that coffee with hot water, that CO2 is raging to get out and it's fighting for the water that's trying to get in, it's coming out. That's why if you do other brew methods like uh, filter, you know about the whole bloom thing. I mean, you're, you're literally trying to let that CO2 get the heck out of the way so you can get in and get a good extraction. So you have to let it rest long enough for that to happen just to have a good extraction. And so that first five days, seven days even, there's a lot going on. Um, volatiles that need to get out that you don't want it, including the CO2. And so waiting for that coffee to sort of like, plat not plateau, but peak, and then it kind of like goes off a little bit, that's a good time. So I don't like to use my coffee any earlier than seven to 10 days. Um, a lot of people that complain about poor extractions and sour, a lot of times they find out like it's good to have fresh coffee, but it's also bad to have too fresh. And that's probably most of those people as well that are getting the coffee from um, their specialty stores is coffee's too fresh and you have to let it rest. Otherwise, you're just not going to have a good extraction. Con con uh, conversely, if that coffee ages for like weeks and, and even a month, I don't know how long you, you're talking about, but after a certain point, then... The, the CO2 goes, uh, gets out, gets flat, the, the aromas, the, the other volatiles are gone, and it will require you to go finer and finer and finer, chasing that same pressure and time. Um, so it's very common, um, and especially don't pre-grind or even grind the night before, even grind an hour before. Um, all these things, as soon as you release that CO2, it, it changes everything. So uh, definitely you're gonna have to keep dialing in and grinding finer with the coffee as it ages. So a lot of people don't realize that, they'll get like a, a 12 ounce or a 16 ounce bag of coffee and they'll have it dialed in that first day and then without noticing it's like slipping away from them. It sounds like that that's what's going from you. Light medium roast, what was the other question? Appreciate to share, usually roasting level you are using, interested to do light medium, light roast, what's the best pulling stance to get a stable pressure? Okay, um, yeah, so light roast, I would say if everybody, so if you're having issues getting a good result from your, try to just stick with the medium roast at first until you know you've got that figured out and dialed in and, and tasting right. People just like dive straight into light, light roast because everybody says that's, that's the shit, that's the bomb, that's, that's where it's at. When you need light roast, you want the, the origin and the, the character of the coffee and you don't get it when you get you know, out of light roast. But uh, I call PS on that. You can get some really great medium uh, roasted coffee that still has the aromas and the flavors and, and, and the nuances of coffee. You haven't roasted it all out yet. So start with medium roast, get that dialed in. Then when you figured it all out and you know you've got a solid preheat, then start playing with light roast. Too many people jump in to the light roast and it doesn't go well for them. Um, so as far as, I think, I don't know, it's usually which roasting level. So I'm always typically medium because uh, for instance, I'm roasting for myself and my wife and my wife doesn't like light roast. So I'm roasting just just dark enough that makes her happy and light enough that I'm getting uh, still to enjoy my, my shots when I'm not doing milk. Great advice, thanks, you're welcome. Small holes up. Is it capable to do four shots with this setup without refilling the kettle? Yeah, this thing's still got plenty in the chamber. I could do four shots uh, if I started that up tall. Um, I don't know, do they have, I don't know, do they have more than one choice? Because I know like the baristas you can get like a 0.75 and a 1.5 or one liter, like you can get bigger ones. So you might, if you know you're gonna be pulling four shots a lot, you might want the, the I think Brewista makes a bigger version. Yes, most definitely beans spring. Oh, thanks, you're answering for me, appreciate it. Pedro, what's up? The OG on the funnel. I think, I think Pedro's the first person I saw this from. So thanks Pedro. Everybody thank Pedro because he's the one that showed us this, at least as far as I know. Oh, there it goes. Uh, but I, I do love the funnel, and that, that just kicks ass, so thank you for that. Uh, I like how you tamped. I'm going to try that tomorrow. So yeah, when, when it comes to tamping, um, if, I haven't, if you haven't read before, like, the tamper is comfortable here, but like, I feel, I don't know, how do you, especially on a high table like this, right? How do I get a nice, consistent tamp when I'm using my arm, my elbow, my shoulder, and my body weight? Um, I think most people tell you, like, even, you know, Bricker Brew will tell you too, like you just press until you can't press anymore 
and you've got that strength in your fingers to do it, and you can kind of lean in like this, but I feel like you can replicate those and you can keep it level because as you're going down, you can keep it level. Whereas if I do this and I come in on an angle, I feel like that, that could go bad fast. And then you get without realizing it because I can't even see where that tamper is. I just feel like finger tamp. It works for me. But again, uh, when I tell people that have like a, uh, an encore, I had a guy in class today. He's got an encore and he's like, number four is too coarse and number three is too fine. <laughs> How do I dial in? I'm like, you can't. You've got an encore. Like you really can't, you, you can't dial in, or at least in the classical sense of how do you, how do you dial in with your grinder? Because the grinder is pretty much, you already know where you have to be. You, you have to either go too fine at three or maybe too coarse at four and then do things like tamping. So, you know, you can tamp light and still get away with a good shot and slowly add pressure and, you know, get water into that puck and compress it um, as you're adding water to it, or you can go coarse and then maybe you want to really like get as much weight as you can on that thing on the tamp and then when you go to pull that shot slam it down to nine bars if you slam that down to nine bars right off the bat you know you can super compress that puck and hopefully get some more resistance when um, it's too coarse so I don't know that probably wasn't your question I'd like to put my body weight into it the lower your counter is yep unfortunately for my filming I have to go too high that's un un uncomfortable so definitely get as low as you can how long to stir with the WDT? So it depends on your WDT. Um, again, this just is, I'm just another guy like you guys figuring this out, experimenting and testing. I could be wrong, but I see these WDTs, people using toothpicks, using like the really, I mean, honestly, where is that? I love everything from Creative Works and Apoctola except these things. I don't like these things. They're very stiff. You've got these little shovels here. Think about it, as you're putting this in and you're moving it, you're pushing coffee left and right. And these things, when you pull them out, are creating these kind of like little holes in your coffee bed. How, I don't, just my, my mind tells me this can't be good. So thin wires, no shovels. And then at that point, don't, don't hang out too long. I, you know, try to make this just sort of like a little bit of moving stuff around. Um, I have the, the niche, hold on. I have the niche zero, it's one of the like, you know, I have the niche and I have the, um, the niche, I'm sorry. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but the, and the Legome uh, P64. These are both excellent grinders, but each of them have their issues putting the coffee. So the grind is coming out really nice, really, really great for uh, extraction, but where it ends up in my portafilter, it still needs a little bit of help afterwards. So like people saying you don't need these if you have a, a good grinder, I, I question that because even my niche, when I, when I use my normal 58 baskets and I stick that in there into the little holder, all the coffee kind of piles up in this direction because the burrs are spinning this way and it's coming out um, kind of at an angle out of that chute. So it's piling up to this side. I don't want to tamp that. I've got more coffee here, less coffee here. So you have to always, even on a good grinder, have to kind of move that around a little bit. Um, what you saw me do, a little this, a little that, helps to just kind of get it there. And then this is just the last touch. I see people spending like a minute in there doing all this stuff. After a certain point, I don't see the point anymore. Um, and you don't want to, to get too aggressive with this, you don't, especially if you have really big, stiff wires, because you're only just going to cause more issues, I think, by pushing coffee into different places. This is nice because you can see how it's bending underneath. So in the coffee, it actually barely does anything other than helps the coffee settle where it needs to settle, you know, sort of homeostasis. And that's, that's why I, I like the wires, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Yes, Bonavita as well. I liked how you tamp. What other things do you guys have for me? That's the red steamer. Other options. Yes, thank you. Oh, I've got help from Pedro too. Sweet. You guys are answering my questions. Uh, thank you. It's about two weeks old now. Let's see. Yeah, that's, you know, so uh, Matt, two weeks old. So it sounds like you started too fresh. So that's the other thing. It's not so much that your coffee's probably where it needs to be right now. 14 days is awesome. That's like great time. 10, 14 days. That's where it leveled off. So what happened was you were probably using it too fresh and having issues, you know, getting in there and then it's finally plateaued. Generally speaking, after seven to 10 days, the coffee mellows out and wherever you dial in, on say like day eight or 10, you could probably stick with that for a little while before it starts changing. I don't find myself 
making too many adjustments in the first, or I would say like from day 10 to, to day 14. That's pretty stable. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate the share, the definition, and when to make small circles. I'm not sure I understand that one. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Maybe that was for somebody else. Pedro, Pedro. Thanks, Pedro. Everyone's thanking Pedro. Yes, he's the, he's the man. Uh, what else? Thanks for sharing. Appreciate share definition. You're welcome. I think that's it. You guys have any other questions for me? Because if not, I think I'm going to sign off. What time is it? 6.48. Longer than I expected. So any other questions? Anybody? Anyone? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. I don't know how many people are here because for whatever reason, on my end, I don't get to see how many people are hanging out with me tonight. It's lame. Why doesn't Facebook want to tell me how many people are hanging out with me? But in um, any case, I think we're done. I think we're done. Any other questions? No? Nope. All right, cool. Thanks, Dave. Random question, is the silicone ring safe to boil? Yeah, so you're boiling at 100 C or 212 F, and this thing is good, 350, 450, usually silicone, most silicone, food grade silicone, you're gonna be able to be safe to temperatures above 250, 300. So if it's sitting there being boiled, it's, it's fine. I mean, I know some people are just like, no plastics whatsoever, it's killing you. I'm not that guy. I would, rather, I would rather enjoy my bacon, my chocolate, my red wine, and inconvenience a little bit and lose a, lose a year off my life. <laughs> Sounds lame, I know, but I don't get too, too stressed about all that. All right, guys. Cool. Should I stay with the plastic tamper or the upgrade to the metal tamper? So, good question <clears throat> about the, the plastic tampers. And it works the same way with the Pro and the classic and the signature. She or he obviously um, has a signature, or a classic I should say, because signatures come with these, or maybe they have a Neo. Um, there's, if you have this at home and you have this at home, you'll see that your base on your metal tamper is wider than your plastic. It also tapers off a little bit. So it had to be that way for other things, but basically, you are gonna have a little side tamping with this. In a pinch, when I'm trying to save weight, I'll take this, I'll leave this behind, and I'll make good espresso, so you can. You just have to be a little bit more mindful and do a little bit of side tamping, or nutation as they say, which is you're kind of moving it like this as you're moving it down, trying to get all those edges and corners. Um, but honestly, I think everybody should have a proper tamper, but uh, you know, to keep price point down and give everybody a, a chance to get in, the Neo and the Classic doesn't come with that stainless steel. But I, I would say you probably don't wanna always have to tamp with this if you, if you can help it. And of course, uh, I don't have them with me. Oh, there they are. Tools, 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 we love our tools. So you, can, you, know, you don't have to buy a flare uh, tamper. You can get any of these cool things from LA Creative Works or Ipoctola or uh, Thailand, our um, J. Kim out in Thailand, our sing um, Flare distributor, he makes some tools as well. There's different places you can find those in the group if you want to use them. But uh, I would say that everybody should have probably a proper fitting tamper and, and these aren't going to be that. All right. Anybody uh, recommended tamp for dark, medium, light? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't really have that. Uh, a different approach. When it comes to the type of coffee, it's always the same for me. Um, maybe more like the pressure would be the thing that I would change. But honestly, when it comes to tamping, find a good tamp that works and, or temp, temp, not temp. Sorry, there's uh, other people, other languages, they, they say temping. Um, so I, I thought that's what you mean. So temp, uh, you know, again, I'm here at 92 degrees brewing everything except for dark roast. I don't even drink dark roast. I can't drink dark roast. Uh, so I wouldn't know what a good temperature for that is, but I'd say, quite a bit lower, um, at least. You know, they, they generally say when you're, when you're, I don't know if you're Celsius or Fahrenheit, um, but say, you know, let's say Fahrenheit, if you're doing a light roast, you should be somewhere 204, 206. Um, if you're doing a medium roast, you know, somewhere around 201, 202, somewhere in there. And if you're doing a dark roast, you know, somewhere around 195 or 96. 
Honestly, I have a, a decent espresso machine upstairs. Decent is a company, not a, a decent as in good. And I have profiles up there that brew at 185 degrees. So you can brew down to 185, 187, but you know, keep in mind, if it's a dark roast, you want cooler temperatures, a light roast, hotter temperatures, and then just sort of play with it in there. There's 46. Thank you, Hester, for sharing. Uh, does the distributor decrease the extraction? That's been the popular discussion lately. Does it? I know, who is that? Uh, Jordan? There's somebody in our group that's like, every time that question comes up, it's like, it decreases extraction. I don't know that I believe that, honestly. Um, it depends on what distributor you're talking about. This is a leveler. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think that the, the, the theory, the concept is, this, this is really just impacting that little layer of the coffee at the top and, and not the whole thing. And if you're only just, say, relying on this to do the work for you, um, it, might, it might decrease extraction. But I think it, Socratic did uh, a test a long time ago or someone else did a test a long time ago where they said, if you use a tool like this and then follow up with a standard good tamp technique, it doesn't have an adverse or a negative effect. I think it's more like if that's all you use. Um, some people just say, I don't even tamp anymore. I just spin that and go with it. I think that might be where this is coming from. I don't know. Jordan, um, you want to link to that? Because you keep, you keep putting it in the comments and I'm not quite sure what you're referencing. But I know that it, it kind of depends on who's doing these tests and how rigorous it is. And then, uh, But I think Socratic had one of the more rigorous tests and they were, they were like, they had or maybe it was common common coffee, uh, showing like four different ways to do it. And they found that basically if you use one and then the other together, it doesn't decrease it. But if you just use that, it does. I could be, I could be mixing it up. Your favor steaming on the top versus immerse in the kettle. Your favor steaming on the top versus immerse in the kettle. Uh, I think you're asking, do I like to on top or in the kettle? I'm not sure, but again, I'm always trying to find a way to do this, get a good result and not, I think I brought it up in the beginning, I'm not trying to make my life complicated. I know that some people, uh, Pedro did, or has done that, or maybe, I don't know where you're at, Pedro, anymore. Um, how are you doing it? Because I've seen you with your tongs and your, your silicone grippers and you get at it. And I know that people, you know, heat everything up, including the screens, and it's great, that works for you, but for me, I'm just trying to get a good result with the least amount of impact on my life and, and time and things. I don't wanna be here 15 minutes later having coffee, um, making coffee, I wanna like get in, get out. So I like just steaming it here and, and getting through that, and it works for me. Like I said, if you can boil at a higher temperature, then you're gonna have more, uh, most of you guys are getting a lot hotter than my 92 degrees. You're gonna have a lot of thermal energy. You're gonna be able to, to fall into a good result, a good zone. Um, so I think you're good with just steaming. But I know um, like Ricka Brew, she is adamant about the, the mocha pots and uh, some other people and those are absolutely gonna get you as hot as you possibly can. Um, I guess that or boiling. Keep in mind that when you uh, pull it out with any kind of moisture, it's good to dab that, dry that off real quick because that water is going to cool everything down real fast. So you want it to be as dry as possible. That's kind of another reason why on the mocha pot works well is the steam stays inside and the outside stays dry. Whereas if you put it in and you pull it out, it's gonna have water all over it and it's gonna immediately drop temperature because that's going to evaporate and evaporative cooling, as you know, um, is going to rob you of some heat. All right, guys, it's an hour. I'm tired. Uh, this is my second hour long class today. I'm gonna go have a beer. So thanks for hanging out with me today. Um, and I do wanna ask if you guys have any suggestions on a better way to do these. I'd like to do more of these, but I don't like having to look through the comments. Zoom kind of works best for me because like I said, you guys have audio and I don't have to scroll and, and is there another platform I should be using? Is there another way we could do this? Um, maybe StreamYard and then I can have both. I don't know. If you guys have suggestions on how to do these a little bit more interactive so I can see you and I can hear you, that's kind of where I want to go. I don't want to just be you staring at me and me staring at comments. When should you pull a shot at six or seven nine bars? Uh, good question, Nacho. Uh, this is the last question, by the way. I'm tired. <laughs> um, I like to brew at six, seven bars all the time. I don't really go to nine bars unless I have to. Uh, generally speaking, 
the higher the pressure, the more likely you're going to experience sprites and sprays and channels because you're really gonna, you know, compress that puck. And, and if the water's not wanting to go through evenly, it's going to, you know, force its way uh, through little channels and such. So, of course, I think, not sure, I think you do a pre-infusion, so that's good. Just make sure if you're gonna hit it with nine bars that you, you do a nice, good pre-infusion, uh, get that coffee ready for pressure, um, get those spaces, you know, in between the coffee, the water starts to get in, starts to expand. It does a, a better job of, of dealing with the pressure when you hit it. Um, but I think six to seven is just easy and it tastes good. I, I like the texture, it works for me. If you don't, people, I know some people uh, like to go really hard, nine, 10 bars, they, 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 they're going for the body. Um, it's, it's kind of up to you, I guess. But I'm, I'm usually at seven bars, if that helps. Discord, can you do videos on Discord? What's up, Rob? I like to do Zoom, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't know, can you do videos on Discord? I wanna be able to do a video, but I also wanna hear and see other people, because it feels weird just standing and staring at a camera and not, <laughs> not seeing what other people are up to or doing. And because we only, we only participate in comments, it's kind of nice for those that are comfortable getting on camera, you know, in their little video or whatever. So if, yeah, if you guys have any thoughts, put those down in the comments afterwards. Let me know what other platforms, or if you can tell me how I can, I couldn't figure out how to get Zoom set up so I could set this event up. Because events, Danny said, you know, these events are good because you all get, people can sign up, you can kind of see who's going, you can get alarms, alerts, and it's good to make sure everybody shows up and they don't mess up the time, which happens sometimes. But I wasn't able to figure out how to get a streaming key into Zoom so that I could stream into this event. I would have to start a separate stream, which I felt like was gonna screw everybody up if I started another stream um, that wasn't the event. So that's the thing I'm trying to figure out, I guess. Otherwise, Zoom's just easy for me because I do it for my classes all the time. Facebook group, these live sessions, like gold support, technical account manager for your espresso routine. Nice. Is there anyone else doing these things? I feel like our group is probably one of the best, like. One of the best, most active, and and full of good stuff. Like I don't know. I don't obviously. I don't spend any time in the rock groups, or the robot groups, or these other groups. But I'm. I wonder if these are are anything like as uh, active and uh, helpful as ours are. I feel like we have a really vibrant community. So, um, kudos to you guys. Because I mean, this doesn't work if you guys are like not tuning in, not participating, not helping. So it's great that we have a really healthy community and people are like stoked to come and learn and share. All right, I'm going. It's time for a beer. Good night, guys. See ya.